the um, thing I wanted to talk about is not about this, but this is um, just a kind of an artist's impression of the world around us. Um, probably being in Italy, I should change that for a kangaroo or so, or something like that. Um, well, this is one way to look at the world. Um, but the way we have been looking at the world over the last 350 years is more like this. Um, but basically, it's, you know, we have done 350 years of very foundational research in trying to figure out what are all these processes that are happening on these different scales and levels. So, um, all the way from, from the, the uh, Napier Stokes equations describing the flow, of course, Schrodinger's equations, and Newton, and Einstein's field equations, all these things that describe in very much detail, very accurate, the bits and pieces of the world around us. The thing that recently is coming to the folk, but to say over the last 20, 30 years, is more the question, how are these things connected? <coughs> how are they connected? And to what extent can we describe that connection? And, um, well, you know, for instance, coming from Schrodinger's equation to the way a metabolism works, it's not that easy. Um, and sometimes you can actually say, from the computational point of view, it's not possible at all. It's just the amount of compute power required for that. But it might also be just totally wrong to think of, of it like that, of to connect how, how we should connect these things. <clears throat> and the field that, that actually, and this is not totally new, people of course have been wondering a lot about uh, how to connect the dots. And I have uh, like uh, a couple of examples of that. So this is uh, already from, from the time of uh, Lao Che, where it said, look at a tree, a mountain or a foam or water, when it hits the shoreline, all amazingly beautiful, all kinds of wild and crazy patterns. All of it has an order to it that we simply cannot measure or describe. So this comes from the Chinese wisdom, more than five, six thousand years old, and already there at those times, at those days, people were thinking about um, you know, how things are connected together. One of my, uh, my heroes is Darcy Thompson, whose book last year was 100 years old. And we had a big party on that in, uh, in Europe. Um, and that book is really, you know, if you ever have time to spend some time on, on a nice book, read this book, it's really great. Growth and form, it describes how nature, how in nature growth and form play a role in, in, in function. And he has the same kind of observation, the waves in the sea, the little ripples on the shore, the sweeping curve of the sandy bay between the headlines, the outline of the hills, the shape of the clouds, all these are so many riddles. It's almost about the, the poetry. But it's also, it really is a deeper question there. And then, of course, uh, uh, Richard Feynman had the same kind of observation where he said, nature not only uses its longest thread, uh, it uses only the longest threads to weave her pattern, so each small piece of a fabric reveals the organization of the entire fabric. So this is the kind of thinking. So can we find ways to describe nature in terms of those underlying patterns? And, and so, yeah, if, if we can, then how would we do that? And how does that relate to the kind of 300 years of absolutely top science that I showed you the equations of? Now, I'm not going to give you an answer to that because <laughs> it's way too complicated, way too complex. We, we don't know. But it's a, an area that is uh, very much um, expanding uh, in, in academia nowadays. And that's this area of complex science or complex systems. So the, the concept of trying to reason about how underlying components somehow come up with this kind of collective behavior. That's what we do, what we call complexity science. And um, there are many definitions around, and the two that I like to use as well, it's definitely, it's obviously not simple. And the moment you try to take it apart, the moment you, you have a complex system, you try to pull it apart, you actually lose what you're looking for. I think that's a very, very nice and very accurate description also, which we can quantify, and I will try to do that later on. And the two examples, and the other one example is that it's, it consists of interacting elements that adapt to the environment that they create. So you get this kind of circular causality in the system. And that's a, that's a crucial thing, which is very hard to solve, actually. So the two examples you see here, this is the, the, the famous flock of birds, where you have this beautiful microscopic pattern, somehow they stick together, whereas you know, nobody knows about, there's no central control or something like that. So somehow the emerging property of, the, of those uh, local rules that the birds have. And this is an example of our research that we're doing ourselves, which is on the immune system, which I consider to be the most complex system I can think of. 
uh, you know, if we talk about when we talk about the adaptive immune system, it's 350 million years of evolution where things are constantly adapting to their environment and changing. And we actually hardly uh, understand what's going on there. So these are some, uh, some examples. And the, 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 the characteristics I'm talking about is that there is no blueprint, there is no masterminds, there's no, not someone that said, you know, that tells, you know, if you can see that these fingerprints are moving and they some kind of walk step through the system. And there's no one that says you have to do it like that, right? And, this, and there's no obvious reason also, I mean, the first time you look at it, it's, it has this kind of collective self-organization going on. And of course, we think and we believe that this has been driven by evolution and adaptation. So we evolved, like, you know, they evolved. This actually, if you do the calculation of these, um, of these penguins, then you can actually show that this way they conserve uh, heat much better than if you do with just a, a random walk there. Um, but yeah, explaining things like this, I don't know. Um, but it's spectacular that it actually happens and that it, that it somehow, so they do communicate things. There is information going on between those animals um, and, and then there is some kind of training or whatever somewhere in their genes. But yeah, no, that didn't happen just like that. So this, 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 there is this aspect of this emergent behavior. And the question you can ask yourself, for instance, you know, a thought is, um, is, is a thing that arises from many firing neurons, right? So but then you can ask yourself the question, okay, so how much of a thought is there in one neuron? And that sounds like a stupid question, but it's not that stupid, right? Because, okay, if you say that the thought comes from all those neurons firing in our head, and then I say, okay, let's, let's reduce it with five neurons. Let's reduce it with 10, with a thousand, with a million, with a billion. At what point in time is that thought lost? Or the other way around, you start with a neuron and I just build it up. At what point in time can I say, now I can create a thought? There's no answer to that. We don't know. And of course, we expect all kinds of nice collective uh, phase transitions happening there, but there is no evidence at all for it. We just don't know. Um, so how much of a thought is there in one room? And is that, is, that a, is that a valid question in the first place? Probably not. But then what is the valid question? So it, it is, we just don't know. Just throwing all kinds of things at you, telling that we don't know. Um, Murray Galman, who was one of the first guys, just in, in the, the physicist got the Nobel Prize for the, the quarks. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with him many times. And the, the example that he mentioned, he said, um, how wet is one molecule of water? And it's the same question, right? It, it, it sounds a silly question and you need to yeah, laugh about it, but it, it, is, it is an interesting thing to, to think about. So you ask about emergent properties like wetness or a thought in terms of these underlying mechanisms and you can, your brain cannot just make that step. So how wet is one molecule of water? Markets and the, the interplay in the industry between all these firms with all these very com complicated and complex technology systems and how they interact um, makes the entire system of exchanges, high frequency brokers, and the interaction between the technology makes it a complex system. And so, for example, the flash crash is the perfect example. There is no cause and effect that you can point to. What caused the flash crash? is a nonsense question. It makes no sense in the context of a complex system. And if you were to replay the same sequence of events identically, there's no guarantee that it would cause a flash crash again. That's the nature of complex systems. Is it a correct remark that a lot of insiders don't understand the markets? I don't think anyone understands what's going on. I think it, that's, that's another quality of complex systems. That they're kind of beyond human comprehension. Well, that's pretty sobering, isn't it? <laughs> kind of behind human comprehension. So anyway, yeah, that, that, that is a very nice example where in, indeed in like in minutes, about $800 billion just evaporated from the stock markets. And the explanation behind this, I don't know how much you know about this, but is because you have these trading algorithms that, that copy each other's behavior. So you get the cascading behavior. So 
one algorithm starts to sell something, another algorithm would notice that it starts to sell. So they actually sell. You know? No people in between anymore. So we didn't mean to actually, nowadays they're doing trading on the edges of like um, milliseconds. And that's the reason why they wanted to bring together uh, the stock market with places where actually the training, where the, where the computers are standing. So they have this very high connection now. Just to be able to do trading in such a short time. And the and point is, we don't know what's happening anymore. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we have to get a better understanding of these. So the examples that I was mentioning, well, a lot of this is, was a long list, of course, but these are the examples that you might not have thought about. Like, for instance, cities. Cities are considered to be a complex system. Why? Because they have this, if, if, you, if you take a city apart, if you look at one component of the city, you actually lose what you're looking for. You cannot understand the social, the cultural, the economic infrastructure and you're from looking at those components. You really need to look at the, at the whole. So, for instance, now in Singapore, we have a lab uh, consisting of about, about 200 people that just look into the concept of complexity for cities, for future city laboratories. And of course, the immune systems I mentioned and all the other examples. And the Internet of Things, I think, is also an example like this. So uh, that's what uh, we think are complex systems and what we try to understand. And uh, it was this fellow that said in an interview um, not so long ago that he said that the 21st century will be the century of complexity because of this need to understand when we have more people, more, more components, more devices linked together in one organic thing, we need to understand what we're doing. We need to understand what we're building, if you think about the Internet of Things, um, or at least try to get a bit of a grip on it. So an important thing to point out before I go and talk about some of the details is that we're not talking about chaotic systems, we're really talking about complex systems. And of course, in chaotic systems, we all know that the main thing is that a small deviation from the initial conditions will diverge in, in, in a massive way because of the non-linearity in the system. So if I, if I replay that thing, so if, if this guy, which has all this, you know, one billionth of a um, uh, centimeter to the left or to the right, that will have a massive effect on the, on the patterns that will be generated here. That's what we call a deterministic uh, chaotic system. And the characteristics of those are that are deterministic because I can replay it again if I would know exactly that number. It's low dimensional. Um, and the uncertainty arises from the practical inability to know exactly those uh, initial conditions of the system. But if we talk about uh, complex systems, well, these are non-deterministic and they are high dimensional. We're talking about a lot of components and interacting in a lot of different ways. And the uncertainty is inherent in the system because of this concept of emergence. You get these new characteristics out of the system that you cannot predict from the lower uh, aspects of the system. So that's an important uh, thing to keep in the back of your mind when we talk about complexity and complex systems. And uh, a, a much quoted thing, which I think to some extent is really relevant to mention, is um, that this complexity, well, it doesn't happen when things are totally ordered. If you have a, like a crystal, it's a totally ordered system Give me a crystal, I can give you, I can describe, you know, in terms of information theory, I can describe exactly what is the content of that crystal and, and how is it, you know, even over time. Um, so, and if I go to a very uh, chaotic system, you know, I actually, so, so this is actually a boring state, right? So there's not much happening here. And here is also not much, not, well, there's a lot of things happening, but it's, it's chaotic, it's totally random. And the interesting thing is just in between. In between, there's something happening where we get this kind of pseudo order uh, uh, that evolves over time. And that's why people try to think of things like systems that behave somewhere in between that order and that chaotic state. I'll come back to that later, but this is just to give you the flavor of where, where we feel that these chaotic systems, in terms of their dynamics, uh, are operating. And then, okay. Um, so what I have, these systems have in common, all of them, and I think this is a very nice way to state it now, is that the, the states of the elements, there's a lot of elements that are interacting with each other, and the state of the elements are changing over time, but also the interaction is changing over time. So it's a co-evolution of states and, and interactions. I think that's the best description 
concise description I can think of is a co-evolution between interactions in the state of the elements and the interactions. Um, and what they do is somehow, the way we want to look at it is that they, um, they store, exchange, and process information. So this is a kind of, we can look at it in terms of energy, we can look at it in terms of whatever, but the way to describe it we feel is in the looking at the way those systems store, transfer, and uh, process uh, information. So the question is, can we predict the future? Because we feel if we can predict the future, we understand things. Rather than machine learning, I don't know if I'm going to say this. Uh, in machine learning, you think you understand it if you can predict the past. I'm <laughs> just happy to have a, a barber in the machine learning. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, so, can we predict the future? There's an interesting thing, which is this uh, so called uh, uh, causal asymmetry. So, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. But is it? Is it really? Um, so, if I have a glass of wine in my hand and I drop it on a, not on this thing, but on a hard floor, concrete floor, um, I can actually in advance predict how it will fall apart. You know, it takes a lot of computation, but I can probably do that. On the other hand, if it's laying there, and David will walk in and see sees this mess here. How would he reproduce from that mess that pass? He needs more information. And this is a general thing which we can prove. It's done by, by people like uh, Jim Crutchfield in very much detail. It's called causal asymmetry. From the past to the future, you need less information than from the future to the past. It's a very interesting concept. Um, yeah, you have to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, also try to get my mind around it. But the, the, the example of class is actually an easy example to remember. So if you go from the past to the future, then you need less information than you go from the future to the past. So David walking into this room needs more information to describe what the, what the state was of that class than me describing what the state of the class will be when I drop it. And uh, I'm talking, uh, one caveat here is I'm talking about classical system, not talking about quantum systems. The interesting thing that was discovered three times, but recently was rediscovered again by a guy called Miller Gould, uh, is actually that in quantum systems you don't have that. So in, in, in quantum information, the, the past and the future are uh, totally symmetric. Uh, so I'm happy to come back at one point in time and discuss about quantum information in relation to this. So we can write some work on that. But um, just take it from now. I'm talking now about classical systems. So what I want to do is take a leap of uh, faith and say, okay, um, although I didn't substantiate it, but I just give you a flavor, what we want to do now is instead of describing the world in terms of mass, energy, and matter, describe it in terms of information and see if that helps us a little bit in uh, for understanding these uh, complex systems. So I say nature processes information. And here's an example, very trivial, but I think also a very beautiful example, the way these communicate um, information. So I guess you know the story, and if not, I'll just very briefly summarize it. There's some food somewhere. Um, this bee has discovered that, that where the food is, and what it actually does, it goes back home. That's what you saw in that little movie over here. You can see it comes again. So it comes back home, and it will wiggle like that. It will make this eight shape, and, the, and these two bits of information, so the shape of the eight, the, the angle of the, the of the eight and the um, so the, the this angle tells the something about the angle with respect to the sun of the position of where the food is and the uh, the frequency of this tells something about the distance how far it is and these two together are a unique indicator of where the bees can find the food so what happens this guy flies back home. He wiggles his thing, he, does, he dances his dance, other guys follow his butt, and, uh, and then they say, okay, I got it, and then they fly up. And so that's information processing, because you can actually do a simple calculation, and what you, can, what, what you find there is that before the dance, they have about 24 bits of uncertainty about the angle and the dire uh, direction. If you want, I can explain that later, but it's 24 bits. Um, and after the dance, then uh, of this foraging, uh, uh, be 16 bits of uh, uncertainty uh, are left, so seven bits are being transmit transmitted. So this is a way, it's, it's, it's just another way of looking at 
things that we've been kind of staring at for some time. Um, and just using Shannon information uh, theory, we can uh, calculate how much bits are uh, transferred in a system like that. Now we've been doing that uh, for many different cases, and uh, I make it a hobby to try to do that with all kinds of uh, natural systems. So here are two examples of what we did. This is uh, work we looked at, um, this is one of my PhD students, where we looked at the uh, formation of uh, stalks by, by bacteria. So this is a simulation, but we did do a simulation to validate, and uh, we validated the simulation against the lab experiments. And uh, for that, we can also calculate how much information is, is these bacteria are transferring between each other and how relevant that is. Um, that is, I cannot explain now, but the bottom line is that each of these bacteria, they do a thing as a quorum sensing, so they feel other bacteria, and based on that, what they feel, which is just a molecule that they observe, they make a decision what to do. And then they form these beautiful stalks, and that makes them very resilient uh, against any uh, kind of antibiotics, which is a totally weird thing. So we can actually link the amount of information transfer to the resistance with respect to antibiotics. Uh, and this is work that I did, I did before, where we look at the amount of information that the HIV virus plugs into the human uh, immune system. Um, and so we can also quantify that. There's no real use of it, but it's fun to actually calculate it. What's that? As long as you don't have HIV, it's fun, right? Uh, well, luckily, it's not a uh, deadly, deadly disease anymore for us. So, um, so the so okay. So, nature processes information. I, I guess I get a couple of examples about that. And the interesting thing is, so did you know that um, your body, every molecule in your body, is replaced? So within a year every molecule in your body is being replaced. It's been tested a couple of times, many times. And um, the really interesting question is, of, of course, so, and somehow the molecule, needs, the new molecule finds its way again, somehow. And um, although when I look into the mirror every morning, <laughs> I think sometimes it makes some mistakes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the bottom line is clear. It, it's, it's somehow, it, so there is, there is memory in the system. And there is something that structures that information. And, um, and, and okay, what is that something? So the, the bits and bytes in your body, they calculate and maintain its own structural integrity, which is again, kind of complexity way for looking at things. So it's there's this information, somehow this information, there is a, an information storage in your body that, that helps to maintain that uh, structural integrity. Um, and this is the, the idea that's behind that. Um, that underneath the comp most of the complex systems, well, I would say almost all complex systems we see, there is there are networks. And this it could, doesn't mean that these are related like physical networks. These could be this could be virtual networks. These could be mathematical networks or abstract networks, if you like. And I'll, I'll tell you later what I mean with that. Um, that that store the information and. Um, to take care of the interaction and exchange. So a few words about networks for those who haven't looked into that before. I'll cut very quickly because it's uh, relatively straightforward. Um, this is a high school dating uh, network. So this one was done in the, in the United States. Um, and they asked over a period of three months uh, who was dating with whom. This could be just romantic, it could be sexual, it could be anything. Um, the blue ones are the boys, the red ones are the girls, and there's a very active boy here. <laughs> <You're in here. laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> so uh, th there are many interesting aspects of this. Of course, you see this 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 you know this guy who's very active, very like uh, behaving like a hub in the system, if you like. There are connectors behaving, you know, connecting paths together. Um, there is this thing that if imagine you carry a, a virus with you, it might actually bite you in the back. <laughs> right. So there are all kinds of interesting things you can look at. 
the point is within this, this long graph, you directly understand what I mean with the network, what I mean with how information or viruses or, 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 or opinions or whatever go along the it's directly clear. That's a nice thing of this example. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of interesting things that to mention here um, that people discovered from those networks. Um, and let me see. So this year, 20 years ago, Page and Brin, they came up with this page ranking algorithm that we all probably know. Um, at that time, they were, just, they were calling it the backrub algorithm. I didn't know that, I just like to talk there. They called it the backrub algorithm. Eventually, it was called Google, of course, but at that time, they were calling it the backrub you know, algorithm, which was basically making use of how um, links are pointing to a document and, and valuing the, the, the link depending on the value of the place where it came from. So, so it was already a kind of a networking approach to things. And then Duncan and Watts, almost in the, it was, I think it was the same week even, they came up with this uh, small world um, uh, concept. And small world concept is this six degrees of separation concept that you know. Um, basically this means that, that within six handshakes I can reach everybody in the world. So I can shake your hand and you know someone shaking hand, etc. That way we reach within six handshakes everybody in the world. So that's me at some point in time. Uh, I met with this fellow, sorry to say, <laughs> um, that's Medvedev, uh, at that time president of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, so I'm hand, one handshake away from him, and he was one handshake away from him, so I'm two handshakes away from Barack Obama. And if you shake my hand afterwards, then there's three handshakes away from Barack Obama. <laughs> and um, now, that, so, and the funny thing is that, that it, and it has been tested in many ways, and for, for, um, for these physical connections, I should say, this physical, particularly for these physical connections, it really holds six handshakes work. Um, so that means that says something about the topology of the, the world in which we live. It has a six dimensional space, right? It tells something about the topology. If you would do this in a virtual world, it's actually much smaller. But for the physical world, it works like that. Okay, so that tells us something about the topology that is underneath the way we are connected in the world. And it was, uh, that concept is known as the small world uh, concept. And that kickstarted a tremendous amount of research, tremendous amount of research. And I'm just giving you one aspect there. And I, I think Barabashi was one to, together with people like the, the Pangani, they're really driving that when we talk about 1999, where they looked into how documents in the internet were connected to each other. And um, just looking at how they were pointed to each other. Right? So if, if one document refers to another document, you draw a line, you say, okay, they are linked together, and they form a network. Or they form uh, yeah, some kind of structure. They did that over 10 billion documents, and what they expected to find was this, right? We would expect that the connect. So this is what does it say? This says K is the connectivity. This says how many links go in or out of the document. To other okay. And um, and this is the probability of that. So what you would expect, like everything in biology, in physics, and, and life, if you like, has this kind of bell-shaped curve. You would expect that there is some kind of average, and in in you would expect an average amount of, of links going out of, uh, of documents. So I would just dig into the internet, find a document, and then on average, I would expect something like, you know, some kind of connectivity that would happen most, and then the ones with few connectivity would happen less, and the ones with much connectivity would happen also less. So there would be this kind of bell-shaped distribution would expect that. What they found uh, was this. So they found this, what is called a power law or a scale-free distribution. Now this is really a crucial thing because that was, once they found that, they found it really everywhere. And um, how to read this, and this is the only equation that, that you want to re remember. So this, how to read this is a probability of having k connections for each element in such a complex network is k to the power of some kind of gamma. And um, it's scale free, mathematically scale free, because if I replace k by a times k, I just get a, in, another constant in front of it, but I still get k to the power of minus gamma. So, um, and because I get a to the power of minus gamma, this is another constant multiplied by that thing. This is remarkable, because this means 
Not that the things are distributed like that, but that is, you know, um, a few number of connections, a massive amount of that, but there are still quite some with a large number of connections. So it doesn't have that shape, no shape. These scale free distributions, we find them everywhere in nature, um, and not only in nature. That's, so that in some people, this part, that's what you would expect, you can find, but you find is this, and this means that there are hubs with a large number of links, and they play a crucial role, and this distribution plays a crucial role for what we're going to talk about in the rest, which is how uh, those complex systems uh, process information. So, these complex systems, because under those complex systems we have complex networks, and they are scale-free, so complex systems are scale-free. Now, what does that mean? And here I think it gets really interesting, I hope. <laughs> I don't know, I find it getting more interesting now. So what is, so this is the thing, right? So this is the probability that the K connection is say is some kind of constant with power minus gamma. Okay, and assume that that means that with one gamma I can describe such a network. Now, um, what I can do is I can calculate, um, it's a pity that there is this thing here, <laughs> but I can calculate the, uh, you know, the first, second, third order moment of such a system being the average, the, the variance, the skewness, things like that, okay. Um, and it's just a simple calculation. And if I do that, I find a remarkable thing. Well, that's not remarkable, it's an interesting thing. I find that depending on my gamma, I might have uh, the, the higher order moments might diverge. Now, what does that mean? Um, and, and for the scale free networks that we will talk about, so that these are social networks, these are the networks that we see in immunology, these are the protein networks, these are the metabolic networks. All those networks that have the gammas in this range. And for that range, that means that uh, where n is 2, which is my variance, that actually it will diverge. So that means that networks that have this structure, this uh, well, that structure, this structure, that they actually do not have an average, or it's zero or infinite, infinite. And they have an infinite variance. Now, assume that that's true. Well, this loop. Um, then it has a consequence. The, the consequence is that the higher order moments they diverge. Okay? And that means that there is no reference and or an infinite fairness. And that means that the more data I throw at those systems, the more exceptions I will introduce. And that means that my learning algorithm will converge. And this is a big step. The bottom line here is if I don't have an average, how can I learn? Right. So if I if I would like to understand an evolving complex network, I would measure things from that. I cannot, and it doesn't it doesn't have an average. So how can I make an algorithm that trains? Because you have to train against something. There's nothing to train against, uh, and so it doesn't have an average, and it has an, in, an infinite variance. So it's not going to work. There's all kinds of caveats here, but this is this is a the crucial message, I think, why I believe that uh, that might be a problem. So a complex system it often makes no sense to talk about cause and effect because they are intertwined. This is again a consequence of the same uh, aspect, uh, or the same aspect is a consequence of this. Okay, so so here are some studies that we did. We did work uh, quite a lot for 13 years actually studying HIV uh, and looking at the immune networks and the um, in the sexual networks. Here's an example of a homosexual network that we unraveled in the United States, and this is the heterosexual network that we studied. The only reason why I put this up is that you can, by just having basically one number, the gamma, you identify that network. Right. So with and so and this network is much more dense, it means the gamma is much lower, and this is a much more dense interconnectivity in the homosexual network. And uh, K Max tells us this tells about how often there are uh, sexual contacts within a, within a year, um, with different types of sexual contacts within a year, and that's 70 there and for K Max and 250 there. You can use that. Assume that you that this is accurate, and um, um, we believe it is. Then you can use that to predict how viruses might go through such a, a network if there's unprotected sex happening. But you can also play other games. You can also say, okay, assume that you know some people are uh, are behaving different than other people. Like they are more protective. They will have a different way how the viruses work. 
And actually, we use this in, the, in, a, in a large study where we try to find an answer to the question, was a European question, but was for one was called the one billion dollar question, but one billion euro question. Um, and the question was, if we want to stop HIV um, pandemics in, in uh, Europe, should we put our money, one billion, into changing behavior or getting better drugs? Because if the drugs are very, really good, then it means that this guy might not have a virus anymore. And so there's nothing to transmit there. And if he behaves better, then it's also good. So what, what is the trade-off between those two? This is a typical, I would say, complex systems question, where if you think about it, changing behavior is a psychological behavioral aspect. And um, uh, a better medication is a pharmaceutical, chemical, biological, and immunological question. So it's really going across those scales that you want in order to give an answer to it. Um, later on, I, if we have time, I can tell you what the answer what to the, the question answer, is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can tell you the answer. The answer is behavior. It's by far the most effective. Um, but the question then is, how ethical is that? So how ethical are you if you, if you force people or if you, if you nudge people to change their behavior? It's like the vaccination stories now, right? So, okay, but anyway, you can prove we did that for uh, large populations. We did it for populations in, in uh, so the heterosexual, homosexual populations in Berlin, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. This is worked for quite some time ago already. But uh, anyway, so that's it. It gives you the flavor how you can use these things in a, in a way. Um, another way we used it is uh, for uh, for drugs networks for uh, you know, heat, uh, cannabis. Um, so very shortly, what we did is um, we had three sets of data. One is we had the arrest data. So people that were arrested because they were doing uh, uh, cannabis production. We had the uh, thing which is called soft data, which is from informants, police that went into the street and saw, you know, this guy we just don't trust and he's talking to that guy, so we have to take, keep an eye on that guy. So these things they write down, so we have you know, that data. And we had data on, um, of course, the, uh, the social media of uh, those individuals because you know, those criminals are also uh, on the uh, internet and using uh, Facebook and others. Um, we did this in the Netherlands for obvious reasons because we have a lot of that going on. Uh, every week, 35 locations are unraveled every week. So every week, 35 different locations in the Netherlands police fines where they are producing uh, cannabis drugs. Um, and it's every week. So why is that? Why, is, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? So that's why we started to do this work. Um, and um, what came out was actually quite interesting. So we built those network, where, which where this, you cannot read this, and that's, that's on purpose. Um, but so the colors indicate you know, uh, characteristics of the individuals, where they came from, like uh, ethnicity or the country that they came from, or et cetera, et cetera. Another thing we have laid out is what they were doing in that network. So taking care of plants, uh, fake owner, uh, or adding weight to the topics, or drying topics, or financing the whole thing, whatever. So we all reveled also the, what we call the uh, value chain of the network. So it's a it's not just a network of individuals with different characteristics, but they also have different roles in the value chain of producing uh, cannabis. And um, then if you do that, then you can actually play games. So you can now say, okay, what would happen if I do what the police is doing, which is taking out the kingpins? So what they do is they take out the hubs of the network. So they identify the individual who's most connected to other individuals in that criminal network, right? Um, and they take them out. So we could replay that in our simulations. And the funny thing is, if we then measure the efficiency of drug production, it actually gets better. So if you take out the kingpins, the network gets better. And that's the reason, and we're pretty sure, that that's the reason why we keep on having those uh, production uh, networks in the Netherlands. This is work we published, I don't know, two or three years ago, I think, 2014. Um, Oh wow, that's very five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing, the good news is that in the meantime, um, they're actually using it. So and they being the, the police and, the, and now also Europol is using it since a year. 
Europol is using these, uh, these simulations to actually see what would be a better intervention. And I'm not going to give you the answer, this is just a, a homework. So what do you think if I, I should, so I should not take out the king case because the network is better. But why is this is another question? So maybe that's question one, why would that be? And the second question is what should I do if I don't take out the king case? I'll leave there if you, if you think about that, if you need to do whatever. Okay, that's a video also. Yeah. Um, so I'm almost getting to the point. <laughs> Um, so what we're talking about is um, how the way I want to look at these things is how information goes through those networks. Works, right? So again, we, we 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 now know what complex systems are. Underneath complex systems, there are complex networks, and they have this filthy behavior. And what we want to do is understand it in terms of how information flows through those uh, complex systems. And so we did a couple of things there. And we had two, what I think are rather relatively fundamental discoveries that I want to share with you. Uh, and what is this? Um, so what we did is we looked at all kinds of complex networks. And all kinds, I mean with different gammas, right? So it can create, you know, there's a real life networks are all between two and three. So I just create a network with two, 2.1, 2 2.3, 2 2 et cetera, et cetera, right? And not create one because for every gamma, you can create zillions of more or less different networks with the same gamma. They can have different cliques, they can have different in betweeners, all kinds of different uh, characteristics. So we did a massive amount of calculations there. We created creating all those networks, and then what we did, we put, we put on those networks, um, we, we had to come up with something that says, okay, this is the way information is going through the network. So we put little, like an easing spin, I don't know, maybe this is just people know or icing spin. Um, so what we do, we put little magnets on each node, right? Little spins. And so the magnet can be parallel or can be anti-parallel. Um, and then we say, okay, what happened if we flip the spin here? How will that affect, how will that information change? Can be an opinion, can be signal. So how can that, if I flip that spin, how will that influence the spins of the others? And how is that a function of the uh, connectivity so of, the, of the gamma. Um, and the funny thing is that the way this information is dissipated through the system, what, 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 what I thought would be driven by the hubs. So the ones that have most connections, right? So I would expect that the ones who have most connections, so that are people that are sitting here, which is the highest set of, yeah, the, the K is a much more, so I would expect that people with a high, uh, high degree of connectivity would be driving the system. I'm saying people with the molecules or whatever. And so I would expect if this was a thing that had a lot of connections and I would flip that spin, that that has a, a higher impact on the way information is coming through the system than the things that are on the low end of connections. Or in other words, I would expect her to be much more influential than him. <laughs> Probably she is, but the bottom line is, from this, that it doesn't follow like that. From this, it follows that, that um, neither of those are dominant in the way information is transferred, transferred. It is actually the man in the street. It's the in between that's more dominant in the way information is propagated to the system. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, we can ask the question why, and we can, ask, we can look at the consequence. So let's look at the consequence. This means that an, uh, an opinion change of this, to people, this kind of connectivity has less effect on the system than an opinion change of people in this part of the system. And, well, you can think of examples yourself, probably. There are many examples where actually we feel that that's a very good like that. But what we did, we checked this, against, for instance, uh, Amazon recommender systems. And we find exactly the same. I don't think I have a slide on that, by the way. I might have forgotten that. I don't know, we'll see. Um, we checked it in looking at uh, gene regulatory systems. We find the same thing there. But we find it on many different levels. So the lesson, lesson from this is, it's not the hubs, it's not the peripherals, but it's something that's in between that actually drives the network dynamics. I, I thought this was a mind-blowing uh, thing. Um, and I still don't know really uh, what it, why, it, why it is like that. Well, we can calculate it. 
but it's really a characteristic of the topology of the network. So here's an example how that works. So this is one of, with a certain instantiation of gamma. Here I flip, I'm in the peripheral now, I think. I flip the spin from, you know, up or down, or opinion A or B, or signal A or, or B, or whatever. Uh, and I look at the consequence on the other spins. And so here is the man in the middle. So here, this has an average connectivity, and I flip, if I flip it, there you go, then you see that it propagates much more than the system than the other ones did. Um, it actually affects the whole system. And if I look at the ones that are mostly connected, this one is really a hub, and that hardly affects the, uh, the other spins around it because of kind of uh, feedback loops that are in the system. It's not, it's not intuitive, of course. We have to do the calculations to see what happens. Um, so this is, a, this is an, I think, a nice example of what you can do with this, this kind of tools. The second thing, I said there were two things that we more or less discovered. The second thing is the concept of stochastic resonance. And later on, I'll show you these things together, how important and few they are. Uh, so the concept of stochastic resonance basically means if you have a system that has, you know, uh, two local minima, that can be two different states, in this case can be different, changing over time, and the system sits here or sits there. Um, what it means is that, uh, let me see if that works. Yeah, it works. So then if I just add a little bit of noise to it, um, there's not much happening. It just stays basically in one local minimum. But if I then increase the noise, it's going to have every now and then you see it actually pop up in the other local minimum. So this means that in order to cross this energy barrier, I need just to give it a bit of stochastic noise. Right? Um, that concept is known as uh, stochastic resonance. It's a bit more involved than this, but this is the basic idea. And so we did that for uh, various networks. Uh, and here's the result. So what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get information from here to there, right? And I do that with a certain kind of success, the performance, right? Um, and then what I do is I increase the noise in the system. And the noise could be that I just change the, you know, a path from A to B. Like that's just instead of going from here to there, just to flip it the other way around. Or I block a transmission or things like that. So I can add artificial noise to the system. And then what I see that the, if I increase the noise, that the performance of, trans, of transmitting that information from there to there increases up to a certain level and after that it starts to decrease. So that means that if I want to get information from one side of the network to the other side, I can do that at, at a certain cost. And that cost will be less if I add a little bit of noise to it until I had too much noise and the whole system will basically collapse. This goes actually down much faster than it's shown here. The whole thing will collapse and then there's too, too much noise and the measures will never arrive. So this could be, intuitively for me, this could be the reason why nature invented networks in the first place as a way to store its information because it means that it's resilient with respect to noise. So small changes in, for instance, a gene regulatory network a small you know, disturbance of that might still make that network do what it should do, namely produce a uh, protein. Right? So that, uh, of course, if there are too many disturbances, it won't work, but this is the, the idea. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Um, so this was basically the story. Um, now I'll just uh, kind of have a move from other things. Um, so where does all this information come from? So, it is it. so everything is information, information being shared. We think this goes through complex systems, they are resilient, with respect to noise. Um, they, they are driven not by the hubs, but and not by the, the peripherals, but they're driven by the man in the street. That whole system is constantly happening. So where does all this information come from? Well, um, ever since Sadiq or no, we were thinking about information as linked to uh, energy and entropy, right? So, um, and that actually, well, it took about 250 years to, to finally have Paul Shannon describing that in beautiful detail. I don't know how many of you have really read this. Everybody uses his equations, but nobody really reads it. <laughs> but if you read it, it's really, it's, it's, it's hard to read because the mathematics is kind of uh, obscurely written, the notations are, but it's beautiful, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so, uh, 
So the idea is that that if it, all the things that we're showing, you know, we can describe that in terms of of, of, of Shannon's um, information theory, and we know that there is this link between information and entropy, right? So if things get more structured, if I the, the amount of bits that I need to describe a certain structure uh, is the information content of the structure, and uh, that if that gets more involved. I need to have more information and then I actually increase my entropy. So what we know is that this relation holds, right? Because just to get about this part, we know that delta S should be smaller than zero because uh, what we know is that the second law of thermodynamics, we think in the end the universe will die and you need that. So the entropy keeps on increasing in the system, right? But it's of course driven, it's of course limited, if you like, by the amount of free energy that I have. Now, where does that come from if I want to ask the question where does information come from? So, where does this energy come from if we look about natural processes that we are observing here, like the growing of plants or just ourselves? Well, that energy comes from the sun, right? The, all the energy that is actually pumped into the biosphere it comes from the sun. So, all the information, if you like, that we can register that we see happening uh, around us comes from the amount of free Gibbs energy that is transformed into structures, right? So, what we can conclude now, can conclude is that, and I like this one, so what we conclude is that nature transforms the Gibbs free energy from the sun into complex systems at the edge of chaos. It goes if they're, again, if they are uh, totally ordered, they cannot do anything. If they're totally chaotic, they also cannot do anything. You cannot process information. So they have to be at that edge of chaos. And then those complex systems, they use networks to register, share, and process the information. And all the while, nature is computing its own future. Because that's what it's doing. It's actually calculating its own, by calculating the next step, it's calculating its own future. So this is another way, again, this is hand-waving, of course. But this is another way, given the things that I just showed you, to look at uh, the world around us. Nature transforms, gives free energy into complex systems, at the edge of case, they use networks to register, share, and process information, and all the while computing its own future. That's, that's I think, the, the concept that I'd like to, uh, to end with. And then the question is, what's the point of this? Why is nature doing that? And I think that, uh, just for fun. Okay. <laughs>